Welcome to Municipal Affairs, the show dedicated to delving deep into the matters that shape municipalities from across Canada. Now, we're excited to bring you insightful stories, engaging discussions, and exclusive interviews with municipal leaders from coast to coast to coast. Today, we will be discussing Alberta Municipalities' campaign to get Albertans involved in a provincial survey regarding municipalities. Then we will discuss the premiers of Canada calling on the federal government to stop negotiating with municipalities and negotiate with the provinces instead. Then we will head to Whitehorse to talk about that fluffy white stuff, snow. And then we will wrap up with a chat with a mayor whose council voted to not accept strong mayor powers. But first, Alberta Municipalities is urging all eligible Albertans to spare just 20 minutes over the next two weeks to have their voices heard on critical changes to local politics. On November 7th, the province of Alberta announced two surveys to strengthen the local election process and improve trust in local elected officials. Alberta's government is seeking input from the public and stakeholders on the Local Authorities Election Act and the Municipal Government Act. The surveys available on the Government of Alberta website aim to gather public opinion on local democracy. Edmonton Councillor Andrew Knack, who also serves as an Alberta Municipalities Director, emphasized the importance of these surveys. So we're here today to encourage all eligible Albertans to, regardless of where they live and work, to complete a pair of surveys uh, that the Government of Alberta launched last week. The surveys are only open for 20 more days and close on Wednesday, December 6th. These surveys relate to two acts, the Local Authorities Election Act, or LAEA, and the Municipal Government Act, which is also referred to as the MGA. Uh, this affects how politics is conducted at the local level throughout Alberta. And we realize that uh, many Albertans may be unfamiliar with these acts, and uh, believe us, we know that they're, they're not often talked about on a day-to-day -day basis. Albertans usually only hear about these acts when municipal elections are conducted, generally once every four years. That's why we want to spend a few minutes explaining why these two seemingly innocuous acts are vitally important to how local politics are practiced in communities across the province. So the first survey relates to the LAEA, which provides the legislative framework for municipal and school board elections. It pertains to municipalities of all sizes and locations, as well as to school boards, Métis settlements, and irrigation boards. It looks at numerous potential changes, including supporting the use of political parties in municipal government, advanced voting, making voter lists available to candidates, rules for postponement of local elections, ability to vouch for electors without government-issued identification, use of special ballots, and use of runoff elections for the position of mayor or reeve. So the second survey relates to the MGA, which provides the legislative framework supporting councillor accountability once councillors, reeves, and mayors have been elected. It considers a variety of potential changes, including mandating orientation training for councillors, expanding the ability for councils to meet in private, authority for the Minis Minister of Municipal Affairs to remove a councillor, changes to the recall legislation, rules for councillors to disclose business interests or other personal history, rules for councillor disqualification, and clarify councillor conflicts of interest. Many members of Alberta municipalities are expressing concerns about the potential introduction of political parties to local elections, fearing it could lead to greater divisiveness within municipal governments. Knack said that Alberta municipalities hopes to motivate more Albertans to take action and complete the surveys on the Government of Alberta website between now and December 6th. So our call to action here is, is really relates to the last time that the Government of Alberta conducted similar surveys. It received about 4,000 responses. And that's actually a very low response rate when you consider the population of Alberta, Alberta was about 4.4 million at that time. When these surveys were launched on November 7th, Municipal Affairs Minister Rick McIver made it clear that he wants to hear directly from Albertans. In the provincial government's news release, Minister McIver encouraged all eligible Albertans to complete these surveys and have their say on how we can strengthen local democracy in Alberta. 
Alberta municipalities' boards of directors completely agrees with Minister McIver on this point. Through AB Muni's effort and those of other like-minded organizations, we hope to spur more Albertans to take action between now and December 6th by completing the survey available on the Government of Alberta website. As to if Alberta municipalities would accept the results of the survey once completed, NAC said that Alberta municipalities believes that Albertans don't want partisan politics in their local elections, as confirmed by an internal survey completed by Calgary-based pollster Janet Brown. Well, I think I'll, I'll answer it this way, because remember, Alberta municipalities already did a survey on this. We uh, ha had commissioned... Uh, Janet Brown, who is one of the leading pollsters in this province, to ask Albertans what they think. And this is the topic that's come up numerous times over the years. So it's worth just sharing the results that we got from our survey to remind folks. We, we have a really good sense of where Albertans are today. Uh, so when we did the survey, we found that 68% of respondents indicated they would prefer to see municipal candidates run as individuals. Only 24% indicated that they would like to see uh, councillor or candidates run as uh, members of a political party. More than 80% agree that municipal officials who are part of a political party would vote along party lines and not necessarily in the best interest of the community. And 69% of respondents think that political parties would make municipal governments more divisive and less effective. And I, I think it's just, again, worth really stressing. So these are surveys that have been done in previous surveys we've seen over and over and over again. Albertans do not want this. You know, I, I, I often challenge people to think, you know, if you're looking at the provincial or the federal systems right now and that partisan system that's set up, how many Albertans would really look at that and say, yeah, I want more of that municipally right now? I, I think the answer is very, very few. So I think the survey results, as long as many people actually fill them out, which is why we're doing this today, uh, would come to the same conclusion that we've seen in our survey and numerous surveys before that. When questioned if partisan politics was already ingrained into municipal politics, Legal Mayor Trina Jones said that some municipal leaders are certainly members of political parties, but local leaders are there to represent the community and not one particular party. So I believe, yes, municipal officials do belong to municipal parties, or sorry, provincial parties. However, we represent our communities. We represent those residents that we talk to every day. And we represent those local initiatives. And we don't think that having somebody else from a, you know, an, another party or somebody we're sitting across the table from should have maybe a not so sort of direct link making our decisions for us. We believe that we are the people, the voters are, <laughs> sorry, the elective level that best represents the people, and we don't believe that party politics has a place in that, as we do believe we should be independent. Join us on Municipal Affairs and let your brand shine where it matters most, in the heart of local communities. Get in touch today and learn how you can make a meaningful impact on municipalities from coast to coast to coast here in Canada. Your success is our mission, and together, we can build stronger, thriving communities together. Reach out today. In a clash between provincial and federal powers, Canada's premiers are challenging the government's housing strategy, accusing Ottawa of sidelining them in bilateral deals with municipalities. Federal Housing Minister Sean Fraser has been cutting deals directly with municipalities, excluding provincial involvement, a move the premiers argue undermines their authority. Ontario Premier Doug Ford coined the situation as jurisdictional creep. Well, housing is a massive issue, not just in Ontario, but right across the entire country. Uh, I've always taken the approach. Uh, we have to take a collaborative approach, working with the municipalities and the province and the federal government. You know, all, all uh, premiers would agree with this. You can't have the federal government going into a, a certain town or a certain city and uh, dumping funding and not even discussing it with uh, the province. That's, a, that's unacceptable. We call it jurisdictional creep. Uh, obviously, they don't want to work collaboratively when they do that. Uh, we do want to work collaboratively. We'll get a bigger bang for the buck for the, the people that need affordable, attainable homes, nonprofit homes, if we all work together. Uh, so we're encouraging the federal government. Let's all work together. Let's look at federal lands, municipal lands, provincial lands, and uh, we'll do a much better job for the people in need uh, right now. So we look forward to uh, 
hopefully them changing their mind, not uh, surprising each and every one of us one morning when they're in ABC town uh, dropping millions of dollars uh, when that's not their jurisdiction. Uh, that's our jurisdiction. We welcome their help and uh, hopefully they, they'll put an end to this. Meanwhile, Alberta Premier Daniel Smith is advocating for fairness and hinted at potential legislation similar to Quebec's, which brokered a substantial deal on behalf of all of its cities and towns in the province. Well, it seems to be working for Quebec. Uh, they're, uh, they have a, a law, M30, which uh, requires the federal government to negotiate with them directly rather than go through the municipalities. That's what we'll be looking at in our province. And you can't argue with success. They just announced $900 million for housing as a result of negotiating on behalf of all of their municipalities. And now all of their municipalities will have a, an equal opportunity to access those funds. What we're worried about is the last tranche of dollars that were announced for my province were 14% of the population, and we got 2.5% of the funding. And so we need fairness, we need um, equity, and we're not seeing that with the current model. So if uh, d uh, defending our jurisdiction by passing legislation similar to Quebec assists us in being able to get fair treatment, then uh, that's what we're going to do. Prince Edward Island Premier Dennis King emphasized the challenge of promoting unity within the Confederation when provinces feel excluded from critical conversations about housing initiatives very eager to talk about this at the table simply because a small jurisdiction like Prince Edward Island made up of 68 or 70 communities of varying sizes, um, not many or any of our communities could handle a project without some provincial investment and assistance along the way. I think our country works best when we have partnerships that uh, uh, I think in this regard with the housing situation we face all across the country, we have willing partners with municipalities, with provinces, uh, with the federal government. We're all working toward the same end. We should be able to work together to create uh, a program that works for everybody. Uh, and I just think that when we talk about a lot of these discussions about housing or some of the other issues that we've talked about, uh, underneath of it all is this Canadian unity debate. And I think if people continue to be excluded, it's really hard to talk about unity and how we can see this country being the best it can be. So I would encourage the federal government to not overlook the importance of provincial jurisdictions in this, we can all work together. We are working at breakneck speed to try to address this housing challenge. Uh, and we need to all be pulling on the same end of the rope here or we're not going to get there. So, Now, in response to the Premier's housing minister, Sean Fraser defended the federal approach in a news conference stating, quote, I have no appetite to slow down when it comes to building homes during a housing crisis, end quote. Frazier added the Accelerator Fund already has convinced cities to reform their zoning laws and increase their ambition on more home building. Quote, the fund is working and it's working more effectively than I think most people expected it would. When we have a tool that's proving itself as an effective way to get more homes built, there's no good argument, in my view, to take that tool off the table. End quote. Now, as tensions rise, the housing debate continues to unfold. The premiers are pushing for a more inclusive approach, while Minister Fraser defends the direct action strategy. Fraser said that there are 540 applications currently under review. The minister has recently made deals with cities like Calgary, Hamilton, Halifax, London, and Vaughan. Cross Border Interviews invites you to join our show and share your passion for public service. We want to hear from you about your inspiring stories and insights on how you're making a difference in your community. Join us on Cross Border Interviews, where leaders from across Canada come together to discuss their communities, their commitment, and their service. Let your voice be heard and help inspire others to serve their communities as well. Contact us today and be part of the conversation. Together, we can build stronger, more connected communities. Canada is often called the Great White North, and that's because of that four-letter word that is either loved or hated. Winter is here, and that brings that lovely white fluffy stuff, snow. Now, for the majority of Canadians, snow comes with its little challenges. But for some, as Whitehorse City Council found out last week, comes with a range of mobility issues. Whitehorse City Council members were confronted with the pressing issue of snow and ice removal policies. 
The majority of the November 14th council meeting was dominated by multiple delegations reapproaching the council for policies that pose challenges for individuals with accessibility issues. The first part of the meeting revolved around the city's approach to clearing parking spots, ramps, and curb cuts designated for accessible parking. Advocates at the meeting advocated for these spots to be included in the city's priority one snow removal policy. Ramesh Ferris addressed the council and addressed a motion by City Councilor Friesen, saying that it was up to the City Council to give equitable access to community services for all of its residents. There's a motion on the table um, presented by Councilor Friesen, and uh, moving, uh, approving this motion moves our community in the right direction and ensuring that our most vulnerable community citizens, First Nations, elders, people with disabilities and seniors will get equitable access to community services, such as being able to do banking, attending medical appointments and supporting the local economy by shopping local. For far too long, people with disabilities, First Nation elders and seniors have been caught in the middle of a turf war between the city of Whitehorse and the local downtown business community. City responsible accessible parking stalls and curb cuts and ramps um, associated with them have been consistently left unshoveled, making the city responsible accessible parking stalls unsafe and inaccessible. This denies some of our most vulnerable community members access to basic community services such as banking, attending medical appointments, and supporting the local economy by shopping local. Ferris said that giving equitable access to city services and program can't be treated like a buffet. When it comes to city responsible accessible parking stalls and equitable access to community programs and services, it can't be treated like a buffet. Community leaders can't pick and choose where First Nation elders, a person with a disability or a senior should have access to within their own community. There are I went around last night and I went around to every street downtown and there are 52 responsible accessible city parking spots in the downtown area that includes Shipyards Park and seven at Rotary Park and so the whole downtown when we're talking about all accessible parking spots that the city is responsible for we're talking about 52. I don't buy that the city of Whitehorse is in financial hardship and can't afford the added expenses for clearing of accessible parking spots, curbs, curb cuts and ramps. Ferris emphasized that the city needs to look at partnerships with the federal and territorial government to help residents with mobility issues in the downtown core. You're telling me that there can't be a partnership made with the territorial government and the federal government to ensure better, better accessibility within the downtown area of Whitehorse. I just wanted to show you my, my crutch here. And I just, you know, some of you might just say, okay, great, thanks Ramesh for showing you, show, showing us your crutch. But what I'm showing you is not only my crutch, I'm getting you, giving you a glimpse into what your future is going to look like. You can't deny disability. Through natural aging, disability will affect everyone, no matter who they are and what position they are, 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 are filling within our community. You are one car accident, cancer treatment, recreational incident, and one knee replacement away from being in our situation and needing exactly what's being asked of you today. Later in the meeting, Council Friesian's motion was debated. Ultimately, though, Council postponed a decision for another two weeks for city staff to provide more information and more cost analysis. Many of the councillors said that they were not comfortable making a decision with the information that they had presented in front of them. Join us on Municipal Affairs and let your brand shine where it matters most in the heart of local communities. Get in touch today and learn how you can make a meaningful impact on municipalities from coast to coast to coast here in Canada. Your success is our mission, and together we can build stronger, thriving communities together. Reach out today. Councillor Paul Russell, who represents the Lower Sackville area on the regional municipality of Halifax, revealed in a social media post last week that he has been recently diagnosed with cancer in his head and neck region. 
The counselor expressed optimism about the recovery, but acknowledged that the treatment process will involve a temporary adjustment to his professional commitments. Quote, we caught this cancer early and I do expect to recover fully, end quote, he said in the statement. Quote, through this treatment and for some time afterwards, I am putting my health above everything else. I need to do this so that I can continue to work for my community, end quote. The counselor is slated to undergo almost two months of radiation and chemotherapy, a demanding regimen that will inevitably affect his ability to fulfill his usual duties. Russell emphasized the importance of prioritizing his health during this challenging period. Quote, this will cause a significant change in my ability to meet and to work as much as I have been. There will be likely unscheduled absences and last minute cancellations. I will not be around the community anywhere near as much as I would like, end quote. Russell, a dedicated public servant, felt compelled to share the news with his constituents and on social media, deeming it as irresponsible not to provide an explanation for the anticipated disruptions in his schedule. Quote, through this time, I am asking for your patience and understanding as I navigate this chapter of my life, end quote. We want to wish Councillor Russell all the best in the upcoming treatments. Cross-Border Interviews invites you to join our show and share your passion for public service. We want to hear from you about your inspiring stories and insights on how you're making a difference in your community. Join us on Cross-Border Interviews, where leaders from across Canada come together to discuss their communities, their commitment, and their service. Let your voice be heard and help inspire others to serve their communities as well. Contact us today and be part of the conversation. Together, we can build stronger, more connected communities. Strong mayor powers have become ingrained in the lexicon of municipal vocabulary in the last year and a half. In the last few months, more and more Ontario mayors in the province have been receiving so-called strong mayor powers. Mayors in participating cities would be given the ability to unilaterally hire and fire key senior staff, table a budget, and override council decisions on matters of provincial priority, such as housing. One of the mayors who was asked to sign on to a housing pledge brought forward by the province and in return would get strong mayor powers is Norfolk County Mayor Amy Martin. During a recent council in committee meeting, a majority of councillors deliberated that the terms of the Ford government's housing proposal lacked clarity. Furthermore, they concluded that the financial incentives for expediting housing projects were insufficient to justify compromising local decision-making processes. Now, we chatted with Mayor Martin about the decision and what happens next for the Norfolk County. We also discuss what impacts the decision could have in the long term for the municipality. Mayor Martin, thank you so much for doing this. I I, I want to start with sort of the basic question, but uh, Norfolk County and yourself as mayor of the county have rejected Doug Ford's strong mayor powers. What was this based on and why did you decide that this was not the right path for yourself as mayor of your community? Um, well, I got to be honest with you, uh, myself to be fully transparent, I voted in support of it. And I, I have a lot of concerns with strong mayor powers. I'll, I'll give you that. But I have more concerns with the financial position and a couple of our large, large, large infrastructure funding requests that we've submitted to the province. And so for five years, Norfolk County has been asking for water money. And I knew that strong mayor powers was attached to the build faster fund, the infrastructure funding. And I have a really hard time going and sitting down in front of, um, you know, minister of infrastructure in January at Roma and August at Amo and saying, we still need that money, just not from that pot, from this pot over here. So um, individually myself, I did vote in favor of the, of the strong mayor powers, but the concerns and the discussion around the table, which are so legitimate from council members, um, were, were concerns about undermining democracy. Um, who's the next mayor? You know, you might have it and we trust you and you're going to delegate these three sections of it back to council, but who's our next mayor and what at what cost? And furthermore, the Build Faster Fund, does it give us enough money 
that we want to kind of sell off that that democratic principle. So that was a large part of our conversation as a council, just the, the erosion of democracy, the perceived erosion. So while you you were in support of the uh, strong mayor powers to be to access the uh, building faster fund, uh, your council was not, and you, they've rejected it. Does this give Norfolk County sort of a push down and sort of put them on a uneven footing with those municipalities who have accepted the strong mayor powers? Yes, it does, and I say that with certainty because we knew that the strong mayor powers and the build faster fund could not be separated from one another. So if you wanted the Build Faster Fund money, you had to vote for Strong Mayor Powers. You had to submit your housing pledge is what you had to do. And then Strong Mayor Powers came. Um, and the other element, actually, I should back it up. The other element is we had a housing pledge suggestion of 5,700 homes. We can do that in Norfolk County. We can build, uh, sorry, we can approve 5,700 homes. What we cannot do is build them we cannot, after they're approved, then put our hard hats and working boots on as council and staff and go out and put shovels in the ground. And so the expectation that council members are supposed to submit a housing pledge that um, that ag agrees and commits to built turnkey homes is unreasonable. We can't deliver on that. We can deliver on approvals. The province was not committing to allowing us to submit uh, approval numbers. So that was the other, sorry, the other part of the question, but now I forgot your follow up there. No, the follow up question on that part of the question as well is, <laughs> um, do you have developers knocking on your door right now? Are people wanting to build in Norfolk County? And if so, um, what sort of challenges or changes now that you don't have these strong mayor powers, is this going to sort of interfere with those developers or are you just going to go ahead with the developers that are currently knocking our doors wanting to develop? Yeah, lots of development happening here in Norfolk County where we have servicing capacity, where we where we can develop. Um, and in fact, I believe we're on our third, you know, highest record year in a row. So since 2020, we've been seeing a lot of that development, including even though we've had a community um, in a development moratorium due to lack of water. So lots of development, it is happening, but what you're seeing coming forward here from our staff, um, because we don't have the infrastructure, because we don't have the funding, and because we're not going to be receiving Build Faster funds, we are approving housing units with a holding provision. Then they go back, so in principle, they're approved. Um, they go back and they continue to work on their, their site plan, among other things. And we ensure, we double check, we triple check that we have water and wastewater capacity for that to go ahead. We might break up that development into sections and allow them to go on with phase one or phase two, depending on the pace at which they build. Because if they don't use it, they lose it. So if they are going to receive their approvals and not use their water capacity, we'll take it back from them in three years time and give it to a developer that is going to build right away. Now that the county has voted to not allow strong mayor powers, this has put you in the spot where you're going to be uh, navigating the provincial government asking uh, Paul Calandra, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, for funding. Um, have you had a conversation since this uh, rejection of the strong mayor powers with the minister? And if so, how's that conversation been or how will that conversation happen if you haven't? I haven't had a conversation with him. I've never um, had the opportunity to meet him, but we had a great working relationship with Minister Clark uh, prior to to him and have spoken with, with him. But um, we have had uh, some letter communication. We've written each other back and forth in a few letters, Minister Calandra and I, and uh, he's disappointed. He's disappointed that we haven't submitted a housing pledge. He's disappointed that our municipality isn't committing to doing our part, working towards the province's goals to address the housing. Um, and we've had confirmation from the government that because we have done, we have not done so, we're not eligible for the Build Faster Fund. But that's the extent of it. He, he's, he's asked for us to reconsider and submit before the deadline. Um, you know, the funny thing is, it, it, it's up to the mayor. I could have, as mayor, submitted a housing pledge and then brought strong mayor powers here. And I see other municipalities did that. But as I, you know, talk, have talked to you about before, um, I, I ran a campaign on rebuilding relationships. And so it was important for me to do that, starting with my own council. And uh, we had the debate twice over, three times over, three times. 
Um, and so I don't think there'll be a council appetite to reconsider the motion to bring about strong mayor powers and submit a housing pledge before the deadline. What's next then? Last question for you. What's next for you as mayor to sort of move past this part of the uh, strong mayor powers, uh, accepting them or not rejecting them as uh, Norfolk County did? What do you do now? Do you just continue on being mayor and hope that maybe two years from now they might re-offer the strong mayor powers or what's next for yeah, you? Yeah, I think we continue to work on our advocacy of our particular needs and priorities, regardless of strong mayor powers, regardless of a housing pledge. Um, we're also members of the Western Ontario Wardens Caucus. So taking my advocacy there and moving the needle, you know, with all of the mayors and wardens in Western Ontario, that, that speaks volumes. I myself, I need to build a, a relationship with Minister Calandra um, and put some face time in, which I haven't had the opportunity to meet him. So I think that's really important. But also continuing my relationship with Minister Surma in, in infrastructure, who's been lovely and very receptive and, and very switched on to the infrastructure needs across all of Ontario. Um, but yeah, you know, moving the needle forward on on what those priorities are and respecting the will of council. And that that's the name of the game. In by-election news across Canada, Helen Schwery is the new councillor for Ward 1 in the city of Cambridge, Ontario, defeating three other candidates to fill the vacancy left by councillor Donna Reed, who passed away in August. In Hinton, Alberta, Christine Lee Chambers is the newest member of Hinton Council, defeating Mike Story, 808 to 355 votes. While in the town's mayoral election, an incredible upset took place. Former councillor Brian LeBurge, who resigned his seat after the former mayor stepped down, was defeated in his bid for the mayor's chair. LeBurge was defeated by Nicholas Neeson. Neeson will succeed Marcel Michaels as the mayor. Upcoming by-elections include Slave Lake, Alberta on November 28th and Toronto, Ontario on November 30th. Heading into December, on December 13th, voters in Ward 9 of Mackenzie County, Alberta, will be heading to the polls to elect a new councillor. There are two names on the ballot, William Auger and Elaine Morris. And Morden, Manitoba, will be heading to the polls to elect a new mayor and council member. Two candidates are vying for the position of mayor, including former councillor Nancy Penner, while seven candidates are vying for the position of councillor. These elections will both be taking place on December 20th. Two resignations over the last week have caused two municipalities to call by-elections for early 2024. The town of Westlock, Alberta, Mayor Ralph Liger resigned in the last week, while Councillor John Kramer also resigned, but to run for the position of mayor. Nomination day for Westlock will take place December 13th, with the intended by-election to take place in January of 2024. In the border city, Lloydminster, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Councillor Aaron Buckingham, a past guest of the cross-border interviews, has resigned from his position on council to become the new city fire chief. The nomination period for this vacancy will take place from January 3rd to the 9th, with an election expected in February. Two municipalities across Canada saw elected officials suddenly resign within the last week with no official words from their municipalities on future by-elections. In the MD of Greenview, Alberta, Councillor Dwayne Didwo resigned from council on November 14th. The press release on the municipal district's website did not give a notice on when a by-election would take place to fill the vacancy. In Chappas, Quebec, Mayor Isabel Lessard resigned from her position as the head of council after two years. She was acclaimed in 2021 and was on leave of absence from the position since September of this year. According to news reports from Quebec, she was suffering from the effects of burnout from the summer's historic wildfires. That's all for today's Municipal Affairs Report for November 20th, 2023. We'd like to extend our heartfelt gratitude for all of those who have tuned in and watched. Your support means the world to us. Remember, our mission is to bring you the most important municipal stories from across Canada, and we can't do this without you. So please keep those stories coming. Share your municipal news, concerns, and even triumphs with us. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter in our communities. Your voices are essential, and we're here to amplify them. Until then, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.